Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Today we're going to talk about uh, a new topic called complexity. <clears throat> can you see the slides, please? Can you tell me? Are you seeing the slides? Okay, great. So what are, what are we going to do in this uh, lecture and maybe Friday is to think a little bit about efficiency of programs. So we've been writing a lot of programs in this course, but we've never really talked about uh, or you know, stopped for a second and thought how efficient my program is. How fast can it run? Does it take you know, a lot of uh, space or not, right? So really our aim or our goal whenever we're writing or building software is to build efficient programs that run in reasonable time and you know, space. Yeah? So they don't consume too much memory in your computer or in the server they're running on. And they also really uh, respond in, in reasonable time. That depends on the application, of course. If you're you know, running a web search like Google or you know, a translation or something like this, you want the answer to be in milliseconds. Yeah? Uh, if you're doing a game or something like this, again, right? The response time has to be very little. Uh, if you're running a machine learning model or an AI system, you could, you know, have four to eight few hours. Yeah, so it really depends on the application. Okay. <clears throat> so we need to estimate the efficiency of programs that we write in order to say whether, you know, it's reasonable, uh, running in reasonable time and space or not. There are two types of efficiency. The first is time efficiency. So how much time would the program take to run for a given input size? The other is the space efficiency. How much space, and we measure space usually in memory, in RAM, yeah? so megabytes, uh, would the, prog the program need for a given input size? In this course, we're gonna focus on time efficiency. So for this lecture and the next lecture, we're only gonna analyze time efficiency because, for two reasons. First, because we don't have a lot of time so you're going to see this in other courses, you know, in a lot of other courses, but more importantly, because time matters uh, the most. Yeah, so RAMs and memories are becoming very big and very inexpensive, but time is something that is crucial. I want my programs to run in reasonable time, otherwise they're use it, uh, unusable. Nobody's going to use them. Okay, so that's why we're focusing on time efficiency. So how I estimate the efficiency of a program? Let's say you've written a program to do something, and I want to figure out whether it's efficient or not. Yeah, I can measure the runtime with the timer, and we'll see an example of this. I can count the operations that happen inside the program as an estimate of how efficient the program is, or I can compute the order of this. And we're going to look at the three different uh, methods for estimating efficiency and pick that one that you know we believe is the best one. Okay. Let's start with the first attempt, timing programs. So here's a program. All it does, it takes a, you know, a value C, converts it into you know, another value, right? We're calling it C to F. Yeah, so it takes maybe an integer and converts it into a float, OK? So this is a function. Uh, how, how do I know whether this function is efficient or not? I have to try you know, for different values of C. Yeah, so I want to see, you know, as C is very large, you know, what time does it take or how efficient this function is. Okay, so I'm going to import the, me the method time. We've seen this before. Uh, uh, we we've seen this before, right, in another program, and we'll see how to use it. Wouldn't measuring the time change because of the speed of the... Yes, and that's why we're never going to use that. But I'm just trying to show you, you know, this is the most intuitive thing. Right? But we'll say we're actually not going to use this because this changes based on the machine right? and based on the implementation. Good point, Rao. Okay. So here's how I use the method time, and you're gonna you're going to use it in you know either this assignment or next assignment. So we really should be familiar with it. Yeah, so I'm importing this library time. Time the time, the first thing that I'm doing here, right? Gives me back the time at this current moment. Yeah. So I'm going to say. Give me the time now, that's t0. Execute the function c to f with a given input. So I'm saying 100,000. I have to try it for 1 million, 1 billion, and see you know, how it works depending on the input size. Yeah, and do maybe an average over all of these. Yeah? And then I'm saying, OK, fine. Once you finish this function, give me the time. 
So how much time did this function take? If I, if I have the time before I called it, the time after I called it, what is the time execution time for this function? Can anybody tell me? Any thoughts? T1 is the current time. So now it's 909 and some seconds. It's T1 minus T2 as, as Michael is saying, right? It's the time before the call uh, subtracted from the time after the call. Yeah, T1 minus T0, exactly. Okay, let's just run it to see, you know, the output of this for the sake of doing it. And then we'll move on. Or explain why, as, uh, as Rawat said, this is not a good idea for computing or estimating the efficiency of a proof. I'm gonna copy this and I'm going to run it here from my editor. Okay, and then I'm going to say run. That gives me back, right? If you call this method with you know 100 million or something like this, this is the amount of time it took. It took five point uh, you know, something times 10 to the power of negative six seconds. So really little, right? And of course, if I change this value, the time would you know, it, it's not significant because the method is doing something really small, but it, it's reduced a little bit. Anyway, yeah, just to, a motivating example, you could imagine this for any program. You could compute the time before the program runs, the time after the program runs, and then see how much time it takes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is not a great way or not adequate for, you know, measuring or uh, estimating the efficiency of a program. First of all, it only works after you've implemented the program. And that's not a good idea, right? Imagine you're writing a really big software, you know, a mobile app or something like this. And then you, in order for you to see whether it's gonna be working or not in reasonable time, you have to implement it. So you finish implementing it and then you run it and then you see the time. And it turns out it takes hours, yeah, to answer, you know, simple things or to give you, you know, output. Then all your implementation is basura. It's gone to the garbage, yeah? So. That's really, we want something that allows me to estimate before I actually run the program or write even the program, yeah? So estimate the efficiency of the algorithm itself. Yeah, that's really what I wanna do. Okay, so that's the first issue. The second issue, that it depends on the implementation. So depending on how I wrote this, if I wrote it with, you know, um, too many if statements or you know with different programming languages it's gonna have different times so it's really not uh, you know not measuring the efficiency of the algorithm itself it depends on the computer program is run on so i'm running it on my ipad you know, or running it you know right now on the server um, versus running it on you know uh, my machine versus running it on a faster machine and so on so really doesn't tell me how efficient the program is it tells me how you know, efficient the program is running on a particular machine. We don't want that, yeah? It also depends on which inputs you run it on, yeah? So if you run it for, you know, 1 million uh, versus you run it for 10, this is, you know, gonna give you different numbers. I, I don't want that. I want something that tells me, you know, no matter what the input is, this is really the efficiency of this program. Okay. It doesn't, in other words, provide an estimate of how the, the program is efficient in general. Okay, so at time two, we're gonna count operations. Why were we doing this? Why does, you know, counting operations can tell me something about the efficiency of the program? Because of the following, we make an assumption that operations, which are mathematical operations, comparisons and assignments. So mathematical operations, I mean addition, subtraction, multiplication, comparisons when I say X is equal, equal to Y, and assignments when I say set X to Y or to five, yeah? These, I assume these guys are, take constant time, yeah? So, you know, some, some milliseconds or some microseconds even. And by counting the number of operations, you know, if, I, if a program takes 100,000 operations, then I know that, right, it's, uh, this is gonna be times, you know, the time it takes to do an operation, which is constant time. That can give me, you know, an estimate of how efficient the program the more operations it involves, you know, the less efficient it is. So I want to reduce the number of operations that happen inside a program. Yeah, because I assume that an operation takes constant time. We don't care about it. We know that this is dependent on the machine and so on. But we know, right, the more operations there are, the less efficient the algorithm is. So our goal is to really write programs with as few 
operations as possible. What are the operations again? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and so on, comparisons, and assignments. Not sure what frame count means. <clears throat> Can you elaborate? Okay, we can take this offline if you, if you it's, a, it's a private uh, question. Count total number of operations in the program, right? So basically what I'm going to do in order to estimate the efficiency of a program is I'm going to count how many operations in total does the program have. And then use this as an estimate of efficiency of the program. So let's apply this on the example we have here on the right, the same function. What are the operations that happen inside this program or this function? Can anybody tell me? Look at the you know thing highlighted on the left. These are the operations. Can somebody tell me how many operations happen inside this function? Again, not sure what what screen frames me here in that context. We'll take this offline, uh, Robert. Okay, so Fed is saying three, right? And then Fed is saying calculating C and returning the number. So we don't count the return, even though it's an operation, but we don't count the return. We just want to count these three things, right? Mathematical operations, addition, multiplication, subtraction, and comparisons and assignments, yeah? But return, yeah, could be seen as an operation. So here is what uh, Fedi is saying. It's three, there's a multiplication here, then there is a division, and there is an addition. So I have three operations as Fedi said. So this one, right? Method, its efficiency is three operations, okay? What about this function? Again, look at the things on the left and tell me what are the operations based on these three sets. Assignments, how many assignments do I have? What does it mean assignment? Assigning a variable to a value. How many assignments do I have? One, right? Actually two, right? right? So this is, right, one operation, which is an assignment. I have in the for loop, there is an operation. Who can tell me what type of operation is there? So in the full loop, I'm claiming that there is an operation that happens and happens multiple times, of course, yeah, because it's a loop. So who can tell me what is the operation in the for loop, in the body of the for loop, in the header of the for loop? Is it a mathematical operation? Is it a comparison? Is it an assignment? What happens? How do I you know, execute this loop? I check, is i in the range of x plus one? Meaning what? I mean, is i equal to x plus one as I, let's say I starts with zero, right? So it will start with zero because I always start with zero. So I'm gonna check is zero equal to x plus one, is zero equal to x plus two, is zero equal to x plus three. So that's a comparison, yeah? And then I have here assignment and addition. So that's two operations. So I have one operation, right? Which is the, which is the, uh, basically the assignment here. I have one operation inside this about, uh, header of the loop, which is a comparison. And then I have two operations, which is assignment and comparison in the, uh, in the plus one, plus equal one, assi assignment and uh, addition. Okay. So does this program or this function have in total four operations because we want to count the total number of operations that you see here, right? We want to count the total number of operations. Is this function really doing four operations or more? Any thoughts? How many operations are there? Four, yes, but note that this is a loop. Yeah? So this loop for i in range of x plus one, this means it executes multiple times. Yeah. So basically I would have these three operations happen x times. Why, right? Because I'm looping from i in range x plus one. So I'm gonna do i zero, i one, i two, until whatever the value of x is. Right? So at the total, I have really one plus three x operation, three times x. It's not x plus four exactly, Marion, but yes, x is a factor, right? It's really one 
And then what happens is these three operations are repeated three times, three uh, X times, yeah? So three times X, okay? But thank you for the, the, the answer. Okay. Tell me here in this exercise, the function does search of, of an element exists inside the list L. So it loops over the elements inside L, checks whether, you know, I, the current element in L is equal to E, the element I'm passing, and then return true if it's found. Otherwise, it returns false. Can anybody tell me how many operations in total happen here? 2L minus 1. Yes, return is an operation. I'm ignoring it, right? It's uh, always, you can always return one value per, per, per function, yeah, or two values per function. So it's a constant, right? So we're ignoring it. Again, we're focusing on these three types of operations. Okay? So Khaled is saying this, this function has two times, you mean length of L, not L, right? L is a list. Yeah, so if I do two times L, it's going to concatenate the list. You mean length of L minus one. Let's see. How many times does this loop run? First of all, it runs approximately length of L, right? In fact, exactly length of L. It goes over all the elements inside the list L. So that's length of L. I know there is a loop that runs length of L times. What are the operations inside this loop that gets repeated? It's one operation, right? That's the comparison. So the function has really, right, two times length of L, uh, two times length of L, Y2, because don't forget that this is also, right, there is an operation here, one operation, which is checking whether I has reached the end of the list. So I have one here, I have one here, so I get two times length of L, right? So it's not exactly what you had said, it's two times length of L, not times length of L minus one. Because this really check happens length of L times, and this happens length of L times. So I have to go from the beginning all the way to the end of the list. Okay. What if you put the first element in the list? Will it take two times length of L uh, operations? So if L, E happens, L, this E guy, right, happens to be the first element in the list. What is going to happen to this function? It's going to check the first element in the list equal to E. Yes, it's going to return true and exit. So how many operations did it do? Only two, right? Exactly. Yeah, so loop is only executed once and I do two operations. Okay. What if the element, this is known first of all as best case performance, just a remark, right? Don't worry about this, but I'm trying to show you that this method is not also ideal, yeah? Because it depends on the inputs. Yeah, so here we're saying, okay, if the input, the element E was the first element in the list, I'm going to need two operations, not two the length of L. Okay, what if E was not in the list at all? That's two times length L, because I have to go all the way through the list to figure out that the E doesn't exist and return false at the end. Yeah, this is known as the worst case. And what if the... What about the average case? What do you think is the average case? So I have the best case, the element is the first element in the list and that takes two operations. And then I have the worst case, the element is not in the list and that's you know, two times length of L. What do you think is the average case for this function, for the search? When would the average case happen? You know? What would I consider average? If E is where? In terms of the number of operations, yeah? So E would be where to consider it an average case. We said best case is the first element, worst case is it you know, not in the list at all. Worst case is not somewhere random in the list, inside the list. Random doesn't mean uh, average case, right? It's actually what Mahdi is saying. If it's in the middle of the list, right? That would be the average case, right? Because I think what Rawat is trying to say is that, you know, you know, with knowing nothing about L and E, the element could be the first, the second could be in any random position in the list. So if you average over all these cases, you get right that the element would be in the middle of the list or halfway through the list, okay? And in that case, it's gonna take, you know, two times length of L over two. Why length of L over two? Because, you know, you'll stop as soon as you find the element, which is in the middle of the list. So you've done the loop on the length of L divided by two, okay? 
This is known as the average case performance. Okay. So counting is definitely better than measuring time because it doesn't depend on the, uh, you know, um, it doesn't depend on the machine. We don't need to implement the algorithm before we compute or estimate efficiency. It doesn't depend on specific input, uh, but, right, uh, it depends on the implementation, right? So of course, right, depending on the implementation, you might get different, uh, you know, number of operations. It also uh, basically has this best case, average case, worst case, right? So it doesn't give you, you know, the performance of the program in general, right? You have to really look at the best case, average case, and worst. Okay, really to be able because the number of operations would differ depending on, you know, these cases. Okay, this is really what we're going to do, order proof. So all of this was just an introduction to what we're trying to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute an upper bound on the number of operations in the program using what is called big O notation. In fact, right, since we're doing a bound, we're not going to be precise. We're going to try to compute just, you know, a rough estimate of how many operations happen inside your program, and that would be, you know, your uh, bound. Okay. Big O represents the worst case. So we're not going to think about, you know, whether the element is in the first, uh, the first element in the list, or in the middle, or, or the last element, or doesn't exist. You always think about the worst case, yeah? Maximum number of operations that happen in the algorithm regardless of what the input is. So it's one number versus, you know, having to look at three different values, yeah? Why are we looking at the worst case? Because it occurs so often, right, in most cases, in most programs. And it's also, it tells you, you know, you know, no, under any circumstances, this is, you know, the efficiency of the program, right? So basically that, you know, your program is going to run no matter what, the maximum, you know, uh, it's maximum, it's worst efficiency is, is, and then you can estimate whether this is good enough or not, yeah? Good thing is it evaluates the algorithm, not the machine or the implementation. So you give me an algorithm, I don't need to implement it, I can just tell you in the worst case, this is what it's going to perform or how it's going to perform. Yes, I mean maximum number of operations. Exactly, that could happen. Yes, Jeff. Yeah. So when I mean upper bound, I mean the maximum number of operations that could happen in this program, regardless of how the input looks like. Okay. Good. Just a motivating example, and then we we'll move on. Let's say I'm building an application to search for a book in the AB library database. So you're, they ask you in the library to implement, you know, a search uh, algorithm for them or search system for them so that I give you the name of the book and you tell me exactly where it is or whether it exists in you know, the database in the library or not. Okay. So assume you have N books, right? In the library or in the database. And you manage to create two programs. The first takes, you know, at most 300 N plus eight operations. So additions, multiplications, subtraction. So we did this math, right? We counted the number of operations, comparisons and so on. And then you said these are 300 and plus eight. And the second, right? So you wrote two algorithms and you don't know which one you should implement and give it to the light. The second is 0.5 n square minus 10. Would you choose program A or program B? I want you to think a little bit about this question. So you've thought about the problem. You wrote one algorithm, A, and that's its you know, maximum number of operation. 300 and plus eight. So if you give me, if there were 100 books in the library, it's going to take, you know, 300 times 100 plus eight operations in total, right? If you have 1,000, it's going to take 300 times 1,000. The second one actually squares the number. So it's quadratic in the number of books, but it has, you know, 0.5 minus 10. Matt is saying he's going to use A. Okay. Let's see. Here's a graph that I'm drawing, right? On the x-axis, I'm showing you the number of books, so n, the size of the input, and on the y, I'm showing you the complexity of the two algorithms, the number of operations for each algorithm. A is the uh, blue one, and B is the red one. As you see, A, you know, is linear, and B is quadratic, right? So we know these curves from, uh, Right, from mathematics. <clears throat> okay, so again, this is N. Type. 
Can you tell me if I give you, if I have 200 books in the library, which algorithm is going to be faster or more efficient? Any answer to this? If I have only 200 books, B, 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 exactly, right? You see that the red line has fewer number of operations. At 200, it has exactly 2,000, whereas the blue one has 3,000 or 30,000, I think. 30,000 versus 20,000. Okay, so the red one is better for smaller values of M. And then as M grows, as M increases, you start seeing that the B would be, the blue one would be much, much, much faster, right? A would be much, much faster because this will keep growing and growing and gets, you know, to billions or millions while this is going slower, okay? That's what I really care about. So when I write an algorithm, I don't know exactly how many books do I have in the library. Uh, this is not an information that could change. You know, I could add, you know, a new collection of 1,000 books tomorrow or 100,000 books tomorrow. So I want to estimate the efficiency of the program in terms of N. Yeah. And then think, choose based on very large M. So if N was very large, right, I obviously have to choose algorithm. Yeah. So basically, I would choose algorithm A. Why? Because I know, right, as N grows, it becomes very large. I, you know, algorithm A would be faster because it has fewer number of operations. Yeah, exactly. So only if I have a small library, but that's not realistic, right? I want to really think ahead. I want to think about the worst case. Remember that I'm focusing on the worst case. Check. That's why I really don't want to take the 300 or, you know, uh, or, or, or starting from the 300, you're right. It starts be uh, like, at 300, they're the same, right? They're exactly the same. But after 300, it starts that, you know, the algorithm A wins. And so I really want to think about the worst case. If I have a very large database, I better choose algorithm. And that's really what we do when we estimate the efficiency of a program. Okay? Type. I'm going to show you different uh, function growth. So that's why it's called growth of function growth, right? Because I'm really looking at the function, which is a function in N, the input size. And I'm seeing how it grows as n grows. Okay, so we have a set of functions here in this graph, and I'm showing you their growth. Okay, so as you see, as you know, the input size or n increases, they behave differently. Okay, so these are right families of growth of functions, as we will see later on. So I have this is one. So basically, I'm saying the following. I'm saying you know there is an algorithm who has one operation only, or a constant number of operations, yeah? One represents constant. See? That means what? That means that it doesn't matter what the size of the input is, it's always gonna take order of one operations. Yeah? So really, you give it, you know, one million book, one million thing, it's gonna say, you know, maybe it is your algorithm for the library search. The book doesn't exist. Yeah? Just tells me that. You know, it's faulty system, but I'm talking about efficiency, not about, you know, whether it's working or not, right? Then there is one that takes log n operations, where n is the size of the input, then n, and log n, and square to the power n, n factor. Okay, tell me which one is the most efficient, you know? Again, think as n grows, as n becomes very large, right? Which algorithm is the most efficient? Which algorithm is the least efficient? If that's the number of operations inside the algorithm. Any thoughts? Okay, so log n is what? Most efficient or least efficient? Most efficient, okay. And what about the least efficient? Looking at the curve, right? As n grows, who you know becomes you know takes much more operation. Okay. So n factorial is the least efficient. Log n is very efficient, yes, but there is a more efficient algorithm than it. That's the constant, right? It's the same no matter what. You see, it's smaller. As eight, you know, at, at eight, obviously log n is taking more operations than one. Right. So really, that's it's ordered from most efficient to least efficient, right? So we see two n to the power n is more than n squared, but less than n factorial and so on. It's, there is no, I don't think there is any realistic algorithm that has constant, yes. So of course it's not, but we need to know, right? We need to know that, you know, there is certain thing that takes constant time because you might have a program that has different functions and one function is actually, you know, taking constant time, but you're repeating it. So you need to know this complexity class. 
Yeah, of course, right? Realistically, there's not a single program that you write that will take constant time. Okay. Fine. Just one last remark about this, and then we're going to start doing analysis of some exercise. So here is right, let's say I have computed the or counted the number of operations or an upper bound on the number of operations that happen inside you know, different algorithms. And these were the ones. What I usually do since I'm computing a bound, this big O bound, right, is that I focus only on the dominant terms. Why? Because as n grows, this dominant term is gonna take over, right? So when I have these, I have these five functions. This one is big O of n squared. Why? Because the term n squared is the most dominant term. Yeah? So this algorithm, it's bound or you know, its efficiency is in the order of n squared. Why? Because that's really the most important term, the dominant term, yeah? the bigger term. Yeah? Because we're looking at a bound, right? And so really it doesn't matter if it's n squared or n squared plus two n. For the second one, can anybody tell me what is the, no, this is big O of what? What is the dominant term here in the second, uh, in the second uh, function, this one? N squared as well, exactly. Third, yes, Mahdi and yes. Third, Jad is saying it's N, right? Because we looked at N, it's larger than log N, right? So it's N. Fourth, Is it n or n log n? Look at this curve. Which one is more dominant? It's the n log n, Jack, yeah? And I drop the constants. We drop the constants. We really don't care about the constants at all, right? I'm trying to say, what is the cleft? It's n log n. n log n has a higher order than n. It goes faster, right, than n. And as n grows very large, right, this will grow much faster. It will dominate, okay? Last one. n to the power 30 or three to the power n, which one? Three to the power, yeah, exponential, exactly. If you look at the curve again, you see that, right? Exponential is much higher than polynomial, okay? Great. So this is really what I'm trying to do. I'll give you a code. All you have to do is try to figure out what is this big O of, yeah? So we see, okay, what are the operations that happen? Estimate them, you know, and then get the I yeah, don't need to count exactly. You can drop, you know, uh, the constants and so on. Let's see an example of this. Let's say I have, you know, this method which computes the factorial of a number. N. Okay, let's see, you know, how many operations happen exactly and then, you know, we'll estimate them. So here I have one operation assignment. Then I have one operation in the while loop, which is checking if N is greater than one. I have two operations here and two operations here. One, two, and two. These get repeated, you know, these five operations get repeated five times. So I have one plus five, right? All of these five operations, right, get repeated five times because the loops run, sorry, n times, not five times. Yeah? So five times n, and then I have the SI type. I know this if I count the exact number of operations. What is this um, then big O of? It's big O of? If I know that it's one plus five. Sorry, Professor. Yeah. Could you explain uh, how you said the two operation here, one operation here? Two operation times and assignment. What are the operations? Assignment, comparison, and you know mathematical operations. This is times. So you say answer is equal to answer plus times n. So you first multiply the answer by n, and then you assign it to answer. That's two operations. Same thing here n minus equal to one. This is one operation because it's assignment, and this is one operation because it's a, you know, a condition, comparison, okay? The condition slash comparison is n, yes? No, it's n. I haven't finished, I, it's, it's one. I'm counting the operations first, and then I'm seeing how many of them get repeated. So it's five times n, right? So I, it's the same, you can count this as n, this is 2n, this is 2n, that's total of 5n as well, yeah? Count the single operation first and then multiply it, but they are repeated uh, with, okay? Type. What is this big O of? Can anybody tell me? It's big O of n exactly as, right? So basically I drop the constants, I drop the plus one, it doesn't matter, right? As n goes, right, what really matters is this, right? That's really gonna determine the complex, okay? 
Questions? Okay. Now I can really look at this in a different way, and that's what we're going to do from now on. Yeah, instead of counting the exact number of operations, what is the dominant part in this you know, program without really looking at you know, how many operations exactly happen? It's the loop, right? This happens n times. This is big O of n. Because there is a loop that runs n times. That's obviously the most thing that's going to take time in this function. So exactly with a while loop. So really, it's big O of n. Why? Because it runs n times. That's really what we're going to do. OK, let's see another example. For this one, can anybody tell me, you know, without counting the exact number of operations, let's just directly look at this code and say, you know, this is big O of this, right? What do I look for if I have an iterative algorithm? The things that's going to take time are the loops, things that get repeated. So this loop, how many times does it, you know, run roughly? The first loop for i in range of n, you know, I'm doing something inside of it, but right, how many times roughly does this one run? N, right? Okay. What about the second one? N squared, exactly. Right. So remember, I'm gonna, this is two loops after each other, they're not nested. So I'm going to do N plus N squared. What is this big O of? So I did this first. That takes, you know, order of n times. And then I did n squared. That takes order of n squared time. So in total, it's big O of n squared, right? So the first runs n times. The second runs n squared. Then it's big O of n squared. Because this is, dominates this as we know. OK? Another example. Again, don't, we don't care what is this function doing. We don't care, you know, really how many exactly, uh, how many operations exactly are happening. Just look at it, right? And try to understand, you know, from it, right? You know, what is the thing that is taking most time and try to estimate its order of growth. So I focus on the loops again, right? And all iterative algorithms I focus on loops. So I have two loops nested inside of each other. How many times does this loop happen? Can anybody tell me how many times does this loop happen? N. Okay. And this inner loop, also N. But what happens is this body, this whole loop, gets repeated N times, right? So I have, you know, N. I'm doing for I range of N. That's 0, 1, 2, 3 until N minus 1. And inside of it, I'm repeating this loop again from 0 till N. So it's really, right? n times n, which is big O of n squared, as somebody said. I know some of you know that from 211, but there are people who have not seen this before. At all. Yeah. So here again, I have nested loops, right? So I have to multiply you know, the number of times this happened by the number of times this happened. Why? Because all of this gets repeated you know, n times uh, inside the outer. OK, so it's big O of n squared. OK, yeah. That's all. Uh, we said the four i in range n repeats n times, and four j yeah. in range n n times, yeah. and x plus one repeats n time n n square times, no? X plus oh, one repeats. Yeah, yeah. But but here is what I'm doing uh, now. I don't know who's asking, but here is what I'm doing right now. I'm focusing on right the loops. Of course, you're right. That's really what happens, and you know, uh, n times, yeah, n square times, but. Really, I'm saying the following, right? This whole loop gets executed n square, n, n, n times, times n times. So that's really, yeah, you're right, yeah? The x plus one is, is really the thing that gets executed, right, n square times. But really, from now on, I'm gonna focus on the, on the, just the loops, right? I don't need to count the exact operation. So I'm looking at this loop, right? This runs n times, and I know that this loop is going to run, you know, n times for each one of these times. Yeah, so it's n times n. Okay? So I'm gonna repeat this loop. If n was you know three, I'm gonna repeat, you know, i would be zero, one, two, and inside of it, right j would be zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, right? So three times. So it's three times uh, right times three, right? So I'm repeating for zero, I'm doing this, 
and then for one, I'm doing this again, and then for two, I'm doing this again. So three times three, and so on. Okay, so nested loops, immediately it's an, you know, the number of times of the outer loop times the number of times in the inner loop. Okay, Jack? All right. So just to recap this, we have various complexity classes. Okay, so we have the constant, we talked about it. This is the fastest. Then we have the logarithmic complexity, the linear complexity, log linear, polynomial, exponential, and then factorial. And that's really from most efficient to least efficient. Okay, so this is really how it's strong. This is the worst, this is the best. Okay, so let's start with the constant complexity. Can somebody tell me, you know, what is the efficiency or the big O, you know, bound on the number of operations that happen inside this method? Tell me, what do I immediately look at? It's, a, it's an idea. Like, what do I immediately look at, right, from the course? What is the thing that is going to take the most time? The Y, exactly. I see an, a loop immediately. I know that this is something I'm going to repeat. That's what's going to consume time at this function is wrong. How many times does this function run? How many times does this Y loop run? Yes, Kyle is saying it doesn't depend. It's gonna run approximately 1,000 times, okay? So it doesn't depend on N, this means it's a constant complex, big O of Y, right? So the constant complexity means it has nothing to do with the input, right? So this method has constant complexity, big O of one, because it's, you know, Whatever it's doing, the number of operations is constant, no matter what the size of n is, it's gonna be constant, okay? So that's why it's constant complex. Okay, this one, we'll end with this one. This is quite complicated. So we look at the logarithmic complex. I have a function here, right? And I'm doing a loop, yeah? So this loop does the following, right? It starts with the value of n, so let's say n was equal to 10. It's gonna check, is n greater than zero? Yes, it's going to print n. And then it divides n by two. So n would become five. Then it's going to check, is five greater than zero? Yes, it's going to print five. And then it's gonna divide five by two. Five, you know, integer division by two, it's gonna give me two. It's gonna check, is n greater than zero? Yes, so it's going to print two. And then divide, you know, two, by two, that gives me one, okay? Is one greater than zero? Yes. So it's gonna print one, and then gonna say one, integer division two, that's gonna give me zero, and that's where it stops, right? Because n is no longer greater than zero. So what I'm seeing is a pattern like this, you know? I start with the whole input n, yeah? I started in this example with 10, but it could be, you know, one million. Then I divide by half, divide by half, divide by half, right, divide by half. So I keep, you know, reducing the input by dividing it here in this example by half. That's immediately a logarithmic, you know, uh, like uh, algorithm, yeah? So why is that? Let's see some analysis. Let's assume this loop is gonna execute k times. We don't know exactly what k is. We wanna express k in terms of the size of the loop. So I'm assuming that this loop is going to execute k times. Okay, this means that the algorithm you know, the loop will stop when, after k times, when n modulus two to the power of k is equal to zero. Why? Because, right, that's, you know, if it's, if, if it executed k times, then I keep dividing by two, by two, right? So I did by two, then by two, k times, right? All of this, k times, right? So I basically, I'm saying n, you know, the integer division two to the power of k, right? That's division successively by two by two k times. That's, you know, that's the condition that would make this loop stop, right? Because n now would be equal to zero and the algorithm would stop. Okay. So what does it mean that n, you know, integer division two to the power of k is equal to zero? That means that n has to be less than two to the power of k. Yeah, otherwise, this would not hold. If n was greater than two to the power of k, then you know, like five divided by you know four is going to give you something, right? Only this is going to be equal to zero if n is less than 
to the power of k. Okay. So n is equal to the power of k minus some constant c. Yeah, where c is, you know, let's say greater than one. Okay, so just some constant. I know that n, if it's less than 2k, it means it's less than 2k by some number, right? At least, uh, you know, one uh, to, to be exact. Okay. Can I get k in terms of n now? If I know that n is equal to the power of k minus c, can anybody tell me how to get n in terms of k? Or k, sorry, in terms of n? What do I do? I say n plus c, so I get this here. n plus c is equal to the power of k. What does that tell me? Can I get k now in terms of n? What do I do on both sides to get k? I do the log, exactly, log base two. So k is equal to log n plus c. Again, this is a constant I can draw. This algorithm is big O. The take home message from this one is that whenever I'm doing you know, a loop and I know that I'm you know, dividing my input size by half and then by half and then by half and then by half and so on, that gives me you know, a logarithmic algorithm. Where did we see this before? We've done something similar, remember? We you know, said divide by half, divide by half, divide by half. When did we do that? What is it called? I'll answer this question, but let me uh, please answer my question. Where did we see this before? This division by half, by half, and binary search, exactly that. Yeah, in binary search, if you remember. We've done this with the guessing, remember? It's a number between one and 1,000. Then I ask you, is it greater than, or less than the half? And so that's binary search. And we'll talk about this again next week. So why is, uh, how is n less than 2k? No, right. Give me, let's take two numbers, right? I'm saying the following, right? Let's take n. One is it equal to zero? This is equal to zero only if n is less than m. Why? Right. Because if n right was greater than m, then I'll get one, at least one point something. Correct? So n has to be less than m in order for the integer division to give me zero. Is that clear now? Take two numbers, right? Seven, you know, div div five, that's gonna give you two point something, so it's gonna give you two. Right? If I take four div div five, that's gonna give me zero. So in order for me to get, you know, from the integer division a zero, then that, you know, nominator has to be, or the thing I'm dividing has to be less than the thing I'm dividing. Hope that's clear now, okay? All right, we'll stop here. What we're going to do is then next time we're going to uh, start, uh, doing exercises on this, as many as we can. Yeah, so we have, you know, like maybe 14 more examples. We'll try our best to do as many of them as we can on Friday. Okay, but you can start, you know, solving a big part of the assignment uh, right now. The second half, the first half was an inheritance, the second half was on complexity. I think you can manage to do most of them right now. Okay, talk to you on, fri on Friday.